Hi, good morning, everyone. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, open source and how open source is transforming the way we build uh, software and services uh, and the future. If you look at the definition of open source, it's kind of boring. Uh, you know, software where the code is freely available and uh, you can modify it and distribute it. So it's interesting that uh, the concept like the source code for software would create so much passion. Uh, Steve Ballmer, when talking about open source, once, said, once referred to Linux as a cancer that attaches itself uh, from an intellectual property perspective to everything it touches. Uh, Linus Torvalds, in response, said, software's like sex, it's better when it's free. Uh, a lot of passion around, around this topic. So it, this story today is a story about uh, a project I started at NASA about five years ago. Uh, my story begins on Earth, actually Google Earth to be, to be more specific. Um, and it's a story about how we created what is now one of the fastest growing and, and largest open source projects in history. And it actually started, as most open source projects do, with a problem. Uh, when I was at NASA, I was the chief information officer at NASA Ames Research Center, and we had a, we had a really big problem. And it wasn't some Bond villain in a layer in a hill. That's actually a, a space telescope that we were in the process of building, and it's called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. It would uh, have a 3,200 megapixel camera. Your iPhone's about 10 and it would survey the entire night sky every day, and it would generate about 30 terabytes of data per night. And in the 10-year operational life cycle of this uh, telescope, we'd uh, anticipate about 100 petabytes of data needing to be archived. Uh, this wasn't the only problem. We were launching a whole uh, series of Earth-observing telescopes, each that would uh, generate a tremendous amount of data. Um, here in Australia, uh, the Square Kilometer Array was another project that would uh, generate as much data, actually five times as much data as the internet uh, in, its, in its operation. Um, so these were problems primarily because um, at NASA, uh, we had uh, to figure out how to do this with the way we were buying IT today. And we were spending $30, $40 a gigabyte for storage. And uh, at these prices, if you do the math back, back in the napkin math, um, not only would we exceed NASA's budget just to do one of these projects, we'd nearly exceed the federal budget of the United States government if we were paying that much for storage. Um, we were literally talking about spending hundreds of billions or even trillions of dollars if we were buying compute and storage uh, by the same, uh, using the same methods of government procurement and using the same contracts at the same prices that we were buying today. So we had to really uh, think very differently about how to build this infrastructure. Um, the project that I was working on involved Mars. Uh, this is the Victoria Crater. Uh, we had uh, the Mars Curiosity rover uh, going around the edge of this crater, uh, and we had a uh, orbiter called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that was orbiting Mars, taking high-resolution images of the planet. And I had just formed a new partnership with both Google and Microsoft. And uh, responsible for this partnership, uh, we needed to figure out a way to take all this data from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, translate it into formats that could be consumed by Google and Microsoft so that they could render it in this 3D image of Mars. So um, I did what uh, anyone who was in way over their head would do, is I hired a bunch of geeks, a bunch of super smart uh, people that were inspired by NASA's mission uh, that really wanted to help solve the problem. And these, these folks are responsible for most of the core code in OpenStack and the Nova project. Uh, these are the developers that you'll find responsible for uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the code at the core of OpenStack. Um, we built this technology and we, we tried to use the same approaches that Microsoft and Google were using in their data centers. So as it turned out, uh, I was a CIO at a place where we had uh, one of the initial uh, places where the internet was, was uh, created, the ARPANET back in the uh, late uh, 60s. Uh, and lots of connectivity, lots of cheap power, lots of land right in the middle of Silicon Valley. And uh, what I was able to do is build these shipping containers and put the infrastructure uh, literally on a gravel right next to May West, which was this seventh node of the ARPANET where we had a tremendous amount of connectivity. 
And we were using the same approaches that Google and Facebook were using. So these, these shipping containers uh, had petabytes of storage, thousands of cores of compute, and cost about a million dollars um, versus the tens of millions of dollars that you might pay uh, to put an, a traditional data center in place. So um, we actually got it done, and we were able to deliver to both Microsoft and Google stunning high-resolution imagery. Uh, in fact, you can go in and download Google Earth or go to your browser and go to earth.google.com or worldwidetelescope.org, and you can actually see um, all of the imagery that NASA has ever collected on Mars. Uh, you can zoom in, you can fly through the craters uh, on Mars, and you can experience that. Um, your kids can, can do this in schools, and it's free. Uh, and there are over a billion people that have downloaded uh, Google Earth and installed it. So this was a way for NASA to take information that was literally probably only seen by a few hundred people, and you're a single click away from being able to explore Mars. Uh, and we made this accessible to literally hundreds of millions of people in the last five years. So the next thing that happened was uh, we, we got a lot of attention around the project, and the White House, uh, sitting in my office, and I got a phone call from Blocked, which is always interesting. So I pick it up, and uh, it's the uh, assistant to the newly appointed Chief Information Officer of the United States of America, Vivek Kundra. And Vivek uh, had been following what we were doing out at NASA, and if I would be willing to host the White House to launch the cloud strategy for the United States government back in 2009. And Vivek saw the opportunity to take advantage of cloud computing to save tens of billions of dollars that the United States government was spending on computing and IT. Uh, the government of the United States is the largest consumer of IT in the world. They were spending $90 billion of the US budget every year on IT. And the opportunity to save money was significant because there were so many data centers, so many redundant projects, so many failed projects. Uh, the idea was if we can use cloud, we don't have to build this stuff ourselves, we can save billions of dollars here. So uh, Vivek came out, this is a picture we took at NASA Ames, uh, where we hosted the launch of the Federal Cloud Computing Strategy at Ames. The next thing he asked me to do was to host a website, which was really important to the president on this uh, platform that we'd created uh, to host all this data for NASA, we called NASA Nebula. Um, it was a website called usaspending.gov, and it was a very ambitious project. Uh, it was something that our president, Barack Obama, when he was a senator in Illinois, uh, got through Congress uh, called the Obama Coburn Act. And the idea was that we wanted to share how the government was spending every penny. And we wanted to create a website where the public could go in and they could see how uh, the money was being spent by contract, by state, um, by company, and you'd be able to slice and dice all this data, four trillion dollars of spending, uh, and we wanted to consume this data from the agencies directly and render these uh, very intuitive visualizations of how, how money was being spent. So this is another website called usaspending.gov. This was powered on the very, very first, you might call it alpha version of OpenStack in our NASA Nebula infrastructure. And this is an unprecedented partnership because we were uh, literally a service provider to the White House for this, for this website. And the USGSA uh, was actually giving us in-kind contributions to host this. I should also mention that both Microsoft and Google contributed financially uh, to the development of the Nebula project and as a result to the creation of OpenStack, which is somewhat ironic, I think. So this website was created and uh, it was, um, you know, it's, still, it's still here today. And um, here's a picture of uh, the president accessing it from the Oval Office, one of my favorite uh, uh, photographs from my time there. And the problem we had, though, you know, at NASA, you know, I knew that I wouldn't be at NASA forever. And the problem is, you know, if you're working for the government, you really can't sell the technology you create. So we didn't create this OpenStack technology to sell it. Um, or this, this cloud technology to sell it. We couldn't profit from it. Um, we obviously needed help maintaining it. I had a team of maybe 10 people working on this, and it was a very ambitious project. And that was a problem. We needed to attract the best developers, and frankly, the best developers in the world don't like working on closed projects. Um, and they don't like working in, in secret, uh, secret government labs where they don't get to collaborate with people. And we knew that if we could make this technology 
uh, available and other people were to embrace it, if we could create a standard, uh, this would benefit NASA because we would be able to potentially have others provide computing resources back to us and the competition would be good. So as a result, um, we decided that we would open source everything. Uh, we would take every line of code and philosophically this made a lot of sense to us because we didn't think that the government should be paying, taxpayers should be paying for code which was proprietary. This was a fundamental philosophical argument. You know, if, the, if public money was being spent on a project, the, the code, the intellectual property, the knowledge created in that project should be open source. And so we, we believe that uh, very strongly, and so we decided to open source the project. Within a few weeks, we got a call from Rackspace Hosting. They were also interested in open sourcing some of their technology, and together uh, with their storage technology and our compute technology, uh, we launched the project OpenStack in 2010. And OpenStack became a, an overnight success. Um, we got a number of companies involved very quickly that also shared this, this vision for an open source cloud platform, something like an Amazon Web Services or a Google Compute Engine or Microsoft Azure that you could run in your own data center. Infrastructure as a service, as software. In many ways, OpenStack is to a data center what Linux was to a workstation back in the 1980s. Um, it's a way you can treat an entire uh, room full of computers as one system. Hundreds or even thousands of computers. Um, some of the more recent large-scale successes of OpenStack include uh, the CERN Particle Physics Laboratory where they have over 150,000 compute cores uh, where they're taking all the data from the uh, various instruments at CERN and processing it using OpenStack. And the US retailer Walmart, uh, which just announced they're using OpenStack to power their entire e-commerce infrastructure, or BMW. There are many, uh, many examples now of OpenStack being used in very large, um, very large environments. So, and it, uh, this isn't a talk about OpenStack, but um, we've recently seen both HP, Cisco, and other companies commit billion dollar investments to, to this project. So this is a project that didn't exist ago, uh, five years ago, that a small uh, group of hackers at NASA put together, and because we decided to open source the technology, we got literally every major IT company throwing their weight behind the project. And now NASA doesn't need to build it anymore, it can buy it uh, from a number of different vendors that are selling products competitively in the free market. So really, what, what I learned from this experience was it's not about the code. It's about the value that the code provides. And there was so much more value in the code that we created becoming available to everyone, becoming a standard in the industry, especially to NASA. Um, it far exceeded the value that just keeping this as a proprietary closed project within NASA could have ever produced. So really, it's about freedom and innovation. I guarantee there has been far more innovation in infrastructure in OpenStack as a result of this project becoming freely and openly available than could have ever happened um, you know, in, in any other context. So put in another way, everybody talks about cloud computing versus on-premise package software, software that you run in your data center. Really what this is about is it's about the difference between sale value and use value. Um, we've often thought about software in the context of something that you buy, something that's sold, something that's it's like a, a manufactured good. Um, and in this model, closed software makes sense. If, if you're selling something that uh, once you've sold it, um, someone's benefiting from it and it's being run and operated and it's kind of theirs, it's a licensed good, um, this makes sense. But if you think about software as a means to an end, as a means of production, um, things change very differently. Uh, things, things change in the way you value software. And if you think about what's happening more broadly in the computer industry today, we're starting to see software more as a utility than an asset that we buy and own and install 
and operate ourselves. And this is reflected in the way we're consuming and using computers. Uh, this is a graph that shows the uh, computer industry from, 2000, from 1995 all the way up and through, through recently, where we look at the market share of desktop PCs, notebook PCs, and tablets. If you were to put phones on here, it would eclipse all of these numbers. You know, Apple sold more phones in a single quarter than the entire PC industry <laughs> sold uh, computers. So, I mean, these numbers are staggering. Um, if you look at this, tablets didn't even exist in the market a few years ago, and now the sales of tablets are exceeding the sales of PCs. And the implication that this has is to economics. The economics of software have changed. Economics, if you look at the definition, it's, it's a science of the optimal allocation of resources in the attainment of values. It's, also, it's about scarcity. And if you think about the marginal cost of software, it's nothing. I can create a million copies of a piece of software. I can download something 10 million times for roughly the same cost as downloading it 100 times. And so if we think about the way open source plays into this, and in particular, in the example we used earlier, if we had kept the technology that became OpenStack to ourselves, if we had attempted to do what NASA had done in the past, which is to license it and to try to generate license revenue from it, the value would have been significantly less than if we had opened it up, created a new standard, and transformed an industry around it. And so to some degree, open source, the more people that use a product, the more people are debugging it, the more people that are contributing to it. And so the more a software project is available, the more you give it away, actually the more value it has to you because you're getting more contribution back. You're getting more people using it. Um, you're, you're creating more standards, more products around it. Um, it's actually profound. It, 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 it flies in the face of economics. It's, it's like negative scarcity. Um, and if you consider uh, what this means to the computer industry, when we bought computers and we bought software, it makes sense to think about software as a manufactured good, you know, in the, in the context of, of traditional economic principles like scarcity. But in the world of today and tomorrow, we're not buying software, we're benefiting from software. We're using software. And it's the, applic the applications live in the cloud. Applications like Facebook, um, Uber, Amazon Web Services, Salesforce.com, Office 365, they're all powered by massive hyperscale computing infrastructures. It's a screenshot of a, it's a picture of the Facebook Open Compute Data Center in Prineville, Oregon massive facilities with hundreds of thousands of, of systems that power applications that are pervasive in our lives, that are on our phones, that are on our watches, that are on our tablets, uh, that are on our PCs and TVs and our cars. And it's the same information uh, in all of these contexts that these applications are presenting. And so as a result, there's, there's no real value in the technology that Facebook uses to build their servers or their analytics platform and so as a result, all the internet companies are open sourcing all the technology. Because if they can create a standard, if they can get people using the technology, it creates more value for them. And so as a result, Facebook has open sourced the designs of all their data centers, all their servers, their motherboards that they use in their infrastructure, their hardware and software. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the companies uh, that build the software services that we consume today are literally open sourcing almost every component of the technology that they use to build these services. Because the value isn't in the software, it's in the utility that the software provides. Um, I think that uh, Eric Raymond, uh, who wrote a seminal book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar on open source software, put it best when he said, software is a service industry under the persistent but unfounded delusion that it's a manufacturing industry. And if you think about this, it makes a lot of sense. Most of the software that we create even today is not something that we sell. 
and we, our jobs are based on the value that we sell the software for. In fact, most enterprises and most people that work in large companies build software that's used internally for the services that that company provides. And if we start to think about the future and the world of tomorrow, we're really starting to see companies become service providers for the thing that they do. If you're a shipping company, you're building software to help understand and optimize the distribution of the packages. Uh, if you're even a retailer like Amazon, you're trying to figure out how to optimize your supply chain, how to optimize the placement of warehouses, how to optimize pricing, how to optimize margin profiles. If you're a bank, most banks are largely huge IT shops that are trying to understand the implications of various factors in the market and playing out using complex algorithms the implications of this or that or this, you know, the, the impacts of, of information that they can attain. Um, there are countless examples of how uh, every company that will be successful in tomorrow's world will increasingly become focused on the one thing or the small handful of things that make them who they are. And they will consume everything else as a service from other companies who make it their business to create those goods. It doesn't make any sense to host email, to host an accounting system, an ERP system, HR system. There are companies that will make it their business to make the best possible software to solve these problems. And then your business will just consume those things as services and focus on the one thing that it, that it was meant to be, its, its reason for existence. Um, this is a great picture uh, that was uh, created by an intern at Google in the engineering organization that shows the social graph. There's actually no map here. This is just uh, a map rendered uh, by the connections between about 10 million different people on Facebook. Um, something you can find, uh, Paul Butler is a gentleman who created this. So really, what, what this is all about is software as a means versus software as an end. And I believe that in the future, software will be more of an end than a means. I think we have left the era where we need to buy software, where software is something that the, the ownership of it is where the, the key value is in it. So my call to action for everyone in this audience, because many of you work for software companies, hardware companies, systems companies. So what I'd like to have you all think about is, is there something in your portfolio of products or services that you can open source. If you're, a, if you're a software company, look at Guy Kawasaki in Canva. The value of Canva is in the content, the templates, the design, not in the technology that's used to render the website. And I'm sure Canva uses a number of open source technologies. And it was because these open source technologies were available to that company that they were able to create that so quickly and to create all the value that comes of that technology. Same is true of Uber, same is true of Airbnb, uh, even companies like Google, uh, Amazon, all build on open source technologies. So if you look at software and you think of it less as a product and you think of it more as say, sheet music in the symphony of human progress, it isn't about your exclusive ability to own and possess that music and play it. It's really about seeing it practiced, seeing it performed, seeing it mastered. And the best way to do that is to set it free. With that, I thank you.